Does anyone remember what happened in Stokes Croft in April 2011? Riots. Right, exactly. And this story is about, uh, if you don't remember, there was a police raid on Telepathic Heights, which is a squad, and uh, some local people took exception to that, and there was quite a lot of violence. Um, this is about something darker that happened at the same time. And it's called The Bag. How I wish I'd never walked that warm April night from St Paul's to Stokes Croft, but a hunger had been building in me, one I knew well. Sleepless and lonely, I'd put my clothes back on, drawn from my bed by the twittered reports of riots, and headed for something that would fill an emptiness in my quietly successful life. And so I found myself amid the mayhem, watching the panic and brutality whose cause wasn't clear, and assuming, stupidly, that everyone else would see I was in my habitual mode of bystander. I was an outsider, curious about these people and what had driven them to clash. There was a crack against the cafe window, and it was the sound of my own head. A policeman had gripped my shirt and thrown me against the glass with such force that I collapsed, all sense knocked out of me, to sit in a stupor on the pavement with my knees up to my chin. There may have been two of them. I'm a big man to be so grievously harmed. A girl in a hoodie, a tall white girl with piercings, asked if I was all right. No one told her, I'm not all right. And she took me by the hand and pulled me up, except that she couldn't have, she was too skinny. Blood was on my fingers after I touched the head wound. She passed me a handkerchief from her little shoulder bag and, in her high heels, led me away down Ashley Road. It must have been 2am, but it was balmy, a foreign land in April. We passed the police vans and stopped a little way beyond them at one of those houses, set so far back from the road that you never noticed them, with iron-worked balconies like the ones in New Orleans. She buzzed, it's me, and the gate clicked open immediately onto the path up to the house. Both the balconies held silhouetted people, the red tips of their cigarettes, and, as I could smell, reefers glowed. The house was full. People were sitting on every surface they could find and leaning against the walls and furniture. A death had hushed them, I thought. A death whispered in small groups. The girl was not phased. She went to the kitchen, took a glass from a high shelf, reaching past a somber man in dreads as though he wasn't there, filled it from the tap and gulped it down, then another, with the people around trying not to look at her, or me. Want some? I shook my head, and the room made me regret it immediately. I could barely think, but her thirst, I considered, must have been as compelling as the pain in my skull. The others remained still and lost looking as she led me through the packed living room to knock on a door. A man answered so quickly he must have been standing by in readiness. His eyes were ablaze, his cornrows like black electricity running across his brain. The way he looked at me, I could have been a lump of crack cocaine whose absence had been tearing him apart. He the one? You sure? The girl nodded, nodded again. I became afraid. The fear clarified my mind, freed it from noticing the pain in the thin plates of bone. I looked past him into the room. An elderly gentleman in a suit lay on the bed, illuminated by a little lamp on a stalk bent towards him. The eyes stared fixedly at the ceiling, and I took it to be the body. Conrose stayed me with a hand and turned to pick up a bag from beside the bed. He held it up with difficulty directly above the gentleman's head. The eyes came to life and followed the bag as Conrose brought it and pressed my hands around its twin handles. It was heavy, all right. The girl looked down, ashamed. It's your time, brother, Conrose said. Brother? They didn't call me that at Rolls Royce and these were not my people either. My God, a woman broke down, whether from relief or concern, and was shushed. The girl dragged me out of there, back down the path. When I turned, the people on the balconies had disappeared. Without a word, she put me back out onto Ashley Road and shut the gate. My head continued to let out a searing pain, increasing in intensity as I bent to gaze upon the bag. Black and heavy in my hand, its sides bulged. But there was no time for consideration. There was a standoff to my right in Stokes Croft, beyond the line of police vans parked by Brigstock Road. Close by, cops stood around with visors up, taking a breather while their colleagues were in the fray. On the one hand, they were all distracted. On the other, I was a black man with a bag at 2 a.m. among just a few people walking to or from the riot zone. A helicopter dragged its spotlight overhead. 
I needed to get rid of the bag. God only knew what it contained, what my brother from New Orleans by way of St. Paul's had put in it. But if I was seen leaving it in the street or questioned with it in my hand, heaven help me. I started walking slowly away to the left without looking behind as though I knew where I was headed, the bag jouncing clumsily with each step. I wanted to turn down Brickstock Road, which was tantalisingly close to reach home as fast as possible, but I couldn't walk past those cops. I resolved to make a detour as quickly as I could to take a side street, find a low wall and drop it out of sight. The thought of what could have frozen all those people made me shudder. I hadn't even made it to the first intersection when the helicopter swooped nearer like a machine out of the War of the Worlds. It slowed, its searchlight probing at the adjacent streets. I prayed for it to keep away, but its eye fell on me. The bag brightened in my hand. I kept going, nice and steady. I even looked up as though I had nothing to hide, and then realised I probably had blood on my face. A nearing siren became a cop car flashing its lights towards me. Officer, a stranger insisted on giving me this bag whose contents I have not seen and have no knowledge of. I was on my way to examine and, if necessary, report it. Officer, yes, I understand your suspicion, but I can assure you of my innocence in this matter. If you like, I can take you to where I was given it. It's not far, and I can describe the girl and the two men. But the car doppled past and the helicopter veered away, called, I assumed, by a crackling report of fugitives from the riot, cop bashes of more significance than a lone man moving slowly with a bag. Eventually I was out of sight of the house and the riot beyond it. I could hear my footsteps now. All those people, they couldn't very well leave the house so close to the police, I reasoned. Not in those numbers. But if there was something bad in the bag, and there must be, mustn't there, wouldn't they expect me to report them? And did they think, what did they think they knew about me anyway? He the one, Colm Rose had asked the girl, and she'd affirmed. What had she affirmed? Home was calling, my sweet bed, but I was starting to panic, the blood mixing with sweat, and I was walking further away to avoid turning where the cops might be, on towards the M32, to where all the guys would be hanging out, beside the coral betting shop or the Criterion, guys who would zero in on the bag. Past the Malcolm X Centre, past the Camel Graffiti, my feet kept stepping as though I knew where I would dispose of this weight in my hand. I would never dream of walking where I was headed now, not at this time of night and certainly not with that wind-up of a white riot going on down the road, keeping the cops busy and out of sight. The little green triangle by Grosvenor Road with the statue of the poet looking out was a haven where I could stop and try to think. It was dark under the trees. The group of guys by the coral just ahead hadn't seen me. I sat on a bench with the bag beside me. All I had to do was to place it underneath. It was 2.30 a.m. The helicopter thumped the air over Stokes Craft. The coral crew was absorbed. No one looked from the windows of the flats opposite. I was nobody, invisible. I just had to get up and walk across the unlit triangle past the poet and back down Grosvenor Road to my home. But then... The bag opened. I swear, it opened itself like a mouth, a mouth with strands across it like spittle. I should have run, never mind what would come to a black man running in St. Paul's. It didn't matter. I needed a church, was all I could think, or a hospital. I needed my desk at Rolls Royce to be anywhere but here. I closed my eyes, opened them to see the bag gaping now tilted to me in the faint light of the bus stop just along the road. If only a bus could come sailing in and open its doors for me with a hiss at this godless, riot-torn hour. I was supposed to put my hand in. I could see that. I kept thinking about my mother at home in London, stooped now, waving a finger, telling me what she would do to me if I sinned. But you know I'm good, Mum. Don't go to Bristol, boy, she said. Dems wild. I took out my mobile so I could see inside by its light, then thought better of switching it on in case the guys saw it. The pain in my head ratcheted up a notch. More blood met my fingers when I gingerly pressed at the damage. I should be headed to A&E for a stitch at least. There would be ambulances at Stokes Croft or I could go to the infirmary. The bag's lips were curling slowly in a wave. Now was the time to get up, but I couldn't. I reached inside and felt in the dark, conscious of the old gentleman lying not half a mile away, and his son, I guessed, who had pressed the bag on me. I'd just assumed this was about drugs or a 20-rated crime of some sort. 
My hand swam in the bag's interior as though in slicked water after a violent flood, thick with belongings. What I took out was two keys on a ring with a label attached. An address was just legible when turned to the light from the bus stop, and the novelty key ring I could now see was a sperm. One of the coral guys was laughing at his own joke, the others complaining. They were trying to cool off in the balmy night, but you could tell it wasn't working, that they were ready to blow off at something. They ignored the police helicopter, were cool about the riot. This was their ground, their encounters with the police were routine, not some special issue. Cha, one of them said. They fell silent when I crossed the road out of nowhere towards them, a hulking stranger stepping on their patch. There were half a dozen of them, some the worse for wear, but maybe stroppier for that. Rass clads, one of them spat. Perhaps it was my blood-streaked face as I grew close, or maybe the fear in my eyes of something beyond them. They stood by and watched me as I walked through them. They even parted a little. I turned down Sussex Place. There was no relief in passing them without harm or having avoided the slings and arrows they must wish they had cast. I would have preferred a beating it would have been done with. The house was a collection of bedsits. Poverty lived here. Inside, I tried the second key in each door in turn. It opened the first up the stairs. The room had been cleared out. There was a single bed, a chest of drawers, a little table and a torn armchair, a wash basin in the corner, a carpet in frayed patches that didn't quite meet. I parted the cheap flowery curtains and opened the window to try to let out the stale smell of air freshener. Once I placed the bag on the table, the first thing I took out was a picture in a gilded frame of me and my mother, which I placed on the chest of drawers. I undressed and lay on the bed. I wondered whether I'd ever see her again. Thank you.